Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading White Fang by Jack London. Without further ado, returning to White Fang as read by Lord Naren White. She lifted up her... She lifted her lip at him in an old snarl of menace, and memory became clear. His forgotten cubhood, all that was associated with that familiar snarl, rushed back to him. Before he had known the god, she had been to him the center pin of the universe. The old, familiar feelings of that time came back upon him, surged up within him. He bounded towards her joyously, and she met him with shrewd fangs that laid his cheek open to the bone. He did not understand. He backed away, bewildered and puzzled. But it was not Kiche's fault. A wolf mother was not made to remember her cubs for a, of a year or so before. So she did not remember White Fang. He was a strange animal, an intruder, and her present litter of puppies gave her the right to resent such an intrusion. One of the puppies sprawled up to White Fang. They were half-brothers, only they did not know it. White Fang sniffed the puppy curiously, whereupon Kiche rushed upon him, gashing his face a second time. He backed farther away. All the old memories and associations died down again, and passed into the grave from which they had been resurrected. He looked at Kiche, licking her puppy, and, stop, and stopping now and then to snarl at him. She was without value to him. He had learned to get along without her. Her meaning was forgotten. There was no place in her for the scheme of things, as there was no place for him in hers. He was still standing, stupid and bewildered, the memories forgotten, wondering what it was all about, when Kiche attacked him a third time, intent on driving him away altogether from the vicinity, and White Fang allowed himself to be driven away. This was a female of his kind and it was a law of his kind that the males must not fight the females. He did not know anything about this law, for it was no generalization of the mind, not as something acquired by experience of the world. He knew it as a secret prompting, as an urge of instinct, of the same instinct that made him howl at the moon and stars of nights, and that made him fear death and the unknown. The months went by. White Frank grew stronger, heavier, and more compact, while his character was developing along the lines laid down by his heredity and his environment. His heredity was a like, life stuff that may be likened to clay. It possessed many possibilities, which was capable of being molded into many different forms. Environment served to model the clay to give it a particular form. Thus had White Fang never come into the fires of man. The wild would have molded him into a true wolf, but the gods had given him a different environment and he was molded into a dog that was rather wolfish, but that was a dog and not a wolf. And so, according to the clay of his nature and the pressure of his surroundings, his character was being molded into a certain particular shape. There was no escaping it. He was becoming more morose, more uncompanionable, more solitary, more ferocious, while the dogs were leaning more and more that it was better to be at peace with him than at war and Grey Beaver was coming to prize him more greatly with the passage of each day. White Fang, seeming to sum up strength in all his qualities, nevertheless suffered from one besetting weakness. He could not stand being laughed at. The laughter of men was a hateful thing. They might laugh among themselves about anything they pleased except himself, and he did not mind. But the moment laughter was turned upon him, he would fly into a most terrible rage. Grave, dignified, somber, a laugh made him frantic to ridiculousness. It is so outraged and upset, upset him, it so outraged and upset him, that for hours he would behave like a demon, and woe to the dog that at such times ran foul of him. He knew the law too well to take it out of Grey Beaver. Behind Grey Beaver were a club and Godhead, but behind the dogs there was nothing but space, and into this space they flew when White Fang came on the scene made mad by laughter. In the third year of his life, there was a great famine to the Mackenzie Indians. In the summer, the fish failed. 
In the winter, the caribou forsook their accustomed track. Moose were scarce. The rabbits almost disappeared. Hunting and preying animals perished. Denied their usual food supply. Weakened by hunger, they fell upon and devoured one another. Only the strong survived. White Fang's gods were always hunting animals. The old and the weak of them died of hunger. There was wailing in the village, where the women and children went, went without, in order that what, they, what little they had might go into the bellies of the lean and hollow-eyed hunters who trod the forest in the vain pursuit of meat. To such extremity were the gods given, driven that they ate the soft-tanned leather of their moccasins and mittens, while the dogs ate the harnesses off their backs and the very whiplashes. Also the dogs ate one another, and also the gods ate the dogs. The weakest and the more worthless were eaten first. The dogs that still lived looked on and understood. A few of the boldest and wisest forsook the fires of the gods, which had now become a shambles, and fled into the forest, where, in the end, they starved to death or were eaten by wolves. In this time of misery, White Fang, too, stole away into the woods. He was better fitted for the life than the other dogs, for he had the training of his cubhood to guide him. Especially adept did he become in stalking small living things. He would lie concealed for hours, following every movement of a cautious tree squirrel, waiting with a patience as huge as the hunger he suffered from, until the squirrel ventured out upon the ground. Even then, White Fang was not premature. He waited until he was sure of striking before the squirrel could gain a tree refuge. Then, and not until then, would he flash from his hiding place, a gray projectile, incredibly swift, never failing its mark, the fleeing squirrel that fled not fast enough. Successful as he was with squirrels, there was one difficulty that prevented him from living and growing fat on them. There were not enough squirrels, so he was driven to hunt still smaller things. So acute did his hunger become at times that he was not above rooting out wood mice from their burrows in the ground. Nor did he scorn to do battle with the weasel as hungry as himself and many times more ferocious. In the worst pinches of the famine, he stole back to the fires of the gods, but he, he did not go into the fires. He lurked in the forest, avoiding discovery and robbing the snares at the rare, in, at the rare intervals when game was caught. He even robbed Grey Beaver's snare of a rabbit at a time when Grey Beaver staggered and tottered through the forest, sitting down often to rest, what of weakness and of shortness of breath. One day, White Fang encountered a young wolf, gaunt and scrawny, loose-jointed with famine. Had he not been hungry himself, White Fang might have gone with him, and eventually they found his way into the pack amongst his wild brethren. As it was, he ran the young wolf down and killed and ate him. Fortune seemed to favor him. Always, when hardest pressed for food, he found something to kill. Again, when he was weak, it was his luck that none of the larger preying animals chanced upon him. Thus, he was strong from the two days, eating a lynx had afforded him when the hungry wolf pack ran full tilt upon him. And, actually, it was a long, cruel chase, but he was better nourished than they, and in the end outran him. And not only did he outrun them, but circling widely back on his track, he gathered in one of his exhausted pursuers. After that, he left that part of the country and journeyed over to their valley wherein he had been born. Here, in the old lair, he encountered Kiche. Up to her old tricks, she, too, had fled the inhospitable fires of the gods and gone back to her old refuge to give birth to her young. Of this litter, but one remained alive when White Fang came upon the scene, and this one was not destined to live long. Young life had little chance in such a famine. Kiche, greeting her of her Kiche's greeting of her grown son was anything but affectionate. But White Fang did not mind. He had outgrown his mother. So he turned tail philosophically and trotted uh, on up the stream. At the forks, he took the turning to the left, where he found the lair of the lynx, with whom his mother and he had fought long before. Here in the abandoned lair, he settled down and rested for a day. And we'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe, as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.